Hi everyone, once again. So let's continue. Now this is the part two, and just to give you a very quick recap about what we had in the part one. Basically, if you got this building, and you have the wind acting on the windward side, or the windward face of the building, uh, you are creating what's called the external pressure. It's going to have a positive sign, and when the wind extends to the entire building, so it creates pressure on all the faces of the building. So we have the windward face, so it has a positive sign, it means a positive pressure. And then if you go to the roof, what you have usually is a section, that is a negative pressure. And then you get to the back of the building, and then there you have a negative pressure at the leeward face of the building. Right, this is what's called the external pressure. And the external pressure doesn't just go from the wind ward to the roof and the final to the leeward uh, face it also goes by the side face of the building and the side face of the building is pretty much similar to the roof of the building we have to divide it into areas each area has different pressure and well you divide it into what's called the local areas so for instance the wind goes something like this right uh, for, the, for the side face of the building and uh, here we're going to have the maximum pressure usually it's a negative pressure and then we have something lower and then the lowest you don't have to divide it into three areas it might be divided into two areas and that depends on certain parameters all right so the external pressure or the uh, the outer faces of the building right we also talked about the internal pressure and for instance, let's just suppose that you have an opening at the windward face of the building. The wind goes inside the building. It gets inside the building. It gets trapped inside the building, creating a positive internal pressure. Now, as you might have noticed, the positive here, it gives for the internal, uh, I'm giving the sign as positive, And it's just opposite to the external pressure. So anytime that the internal pressure points out towards the building, then you give it as a positive sign. Now, if the opening happens to be at the leeward face of the building, then the wind goes something like this, right? And uh, it creates kind of gap here, vacuum. So the air inside the building will try to get outside the building, okay, from the high pressure to, to the lower one, creating section that is a negative internal pressure. And well, that's that's I think pretty much all of it and uh, now let's move to the to the slide and I think this figure has a beauty in it uh, I took it from this website and it really explains what's called the local pressures now if you see the corners here of the building you see the corners have relatively higher pressure compared to the vertical walls okay because as we said we're talking about the local pressures as the one in the roof just the same as the side face of the building and you, you might also tell that for the roof the maximum value you might get is here at the edge so we have the corners and we have the edges and you see the maximum value for the local pressure is just at this uh, location and why I'm mentioning the local pressures is that because whenever you are designing the cladding, windows or connection, you have to take care of this pressure. I mean, let's suppose that I want to design the roof. I don't have to design the entire roof based on the maximum value I get here, the maximum pressure here. No, you designed it as an overall load. So something, I mean, you take this load and design the entire load based on this. But when it comes to the cladding, when it comes to the windows or connection for this part of the building, for the edges or the corners, you have to consider the local pressure, right? So uh, that's pretty much all of it. And uh, yeah, so let's jump to our example. Now, as said before, uh, we are trying to calculate the wind load on our structure. It's an industrial steel warehouse and as I said before, we need to know the dimensions of the building. We have the width, we have the length, and we need to know the closest distance to sea. 
which in this case is 12 kilometer. And I've got the link, I'll show you how to do it on Google Maps. Uh, also the altitude is something that you have to determine. Again, you can easily Google it, you can find it. Uh, it depends on your region and, um, or you can make an assumption based on this. Again, uh, I need to know also the location of my uh, site. In this case, it's Muscat. And I don't really need the rest of the details here. I just need the height of the building, the height to eaves. This is the peak height. And well, let's start. Now, the first thing that you might want to start with is the dynamic classification. And uh, this is something very essential. I mean, if I want to calculate the wind action on my building, I must first ask myself whether this code will be applicable for, for the wind load calculation for my building. First of all, you go to the clause 1.6.1. It explains what's called the dynamic classification, right? We know that the wind causes fluctuating loads on buildings. It changes all the, all the time and with different magnitudes and directions. Now the code tries to treat it as static from fluctuating loads to static. And this is only possible if the building is not susceptible to dynamic excitation. What do I mean by dynamic excitation? This is simply, if you got this cylinder building, this thin, tall building, and the wind hits the building, the wind might cause an excessive um, movement of the building. In this case, you really cannot treat the load, the wind load, as a static, because it moves a lot. It creates what's called dynamic excitation. So the static analysis is not allowed in this case. You have to go for the dynamic analysis. Now, uh, I have to determine the uh, dynamic classification of my uh, building, and the code guides you to do so. There's what's called the argumentation factor, CR. Okay, the argumentation factor will tell you whether the wind calculation for your building is applicable or not using this code. Right, it depends on the height of the building and a factor called factor building factor KB. Let me take the height of my building. I'm, I'm taking the maximum height, the maximum peak height at the gable face, 12 meters. And the building type factor, you have to refer to table one of the code. And it depends on the type of your building. So I'm talking about what type here, water shed. And if you check the table, the KB value for this building, okay, is two. There are a list of five types. You can refer to table one, depending again on your structure, what type of structure you are um, considering. Right, so I have it. I have the height and I have the KB value. What do I do with them? You have to refer to the figure three. This is the figure three from the code. And this tells you how to determine the dynamic argumentation factor for your uh, case. Right, this is the height of the building. So my height is 12 meters, it's somewhere there. And if I go up, up to this curve with a KB value of two, that's my uh, building type factor. And then I go to the Y axis, what I get is the dynamic factor, CR. And what you can tell is my value is somewhere here. It's even less than 0 0.1, but how could the 0 0.1 help me to know whether I can use the code or not? Simply, there's a limit. The code gives the limit. Now, you see, CR must be less than 0 0.25. This is the limit given by the code. If I get my CR more than 0 0.25, then I will not be able to use the code for load calculation. And the height of the building as well, it must be less than 300 meters. This is the limit. So basically, the inner area here means that you can use the code for the wind load calculation for your uh, considered building. But if you go beyond the area, that means you cannot use the code. So for my case, um, I was really I mean, confident about the application of this code for my building and well, I can use it for my building. All right, 
Moving on, let's just consider now the building geometry. Again, the L is something fixed. The W is also something fixed. I've got my W at the width as 30 meters, and I've got the L, the length as 45 meters. So this is the length and the width. Now, I've got two heights. First of all is the height to eaves. This one here is given as 10 meters. And I've got the maximum height at the gable face, the peak height, as 12 meters. Now, going to this clause, it tells you what height you need basically to use for the entire calculation. Again, we need to consider both directions, the 0 degree and the 90 degree. Now, if the wind blows in this direction, what's the height of the building? It's not 12 meters, it should be 10 meters, but I'm being more conservative in this case, and I'm taking the height either on this direction or on this direction. Both of the directions, I take it as 12 meters, okay? So if you take the height here as 10 meters, that's, that's correct. And uh, here it must be the maximum, which in this case is the 12 meters. Right, now the building is symmetric. That means I can use the zero and the 90 degree wind direction. Right, let's move to the clause 2.2.3.2. Now here's something important. I have to compare the height of the building to the cross wind breadth, the B. Remember, B is a variable. That means it changes with the wind direction being changed. So for the zero degree, the cross wind width is going to be 45 meters. And for the 90 degree, the cross wind, the B, is going to be 30 meters. Now I have to compare the height of the building for each direction considered with a cross wind width because I have to know whether I have to treat my building as one part or not. Basically, if I've got this um, building, you see this building is wider than it's taller then I have only to treat this building as one part. But if I got this tall building, then I have to divide it into multiple parts. So for my case, if I'm taking the wind on this direction, right, I have to treat it as one part. If I take the wind from this direction, I just treat it as one part. Let's get moved and, well, I can very quickly uh, calculate the angle. It is very simple. You got the gable face here, and the length from the center to the end is 15 meters. I've got the length here, and I'm having the height here as 12 meters, and here just 10, so the difference is 2 meters. And the angle turns out to be this is just the opposite of the adjacent. The angle is 7.6. Right, I'm going to need the pitch angle, so this is just a very quick calculation. Now, to the exciting part of the calculation. Now, we need to determine the wind speed, the effective wind speed, and the dynamic pressure. Again, this is the dynamic pressure, the QS, and it's equal to 0 0.613 VE square. The VE is the effective wind speed, and it has its own formula. The VS is the side wind speed in meter per second, and we have the SB, the terrain and building factor. And the VS, the VS also has its own formula. You see, we have the VP, the VP is the basic wind speed in meter per second. You can determine this very easily from uh, your local basic wind speed uh, map. We got this as uh, factors. The S is the altitude factor, the SD is the direction factor, SS is the seasonal factor, and then the SP is the probability factor. Right, let me just try to make it easier for you. First of all, we have to determine the VS, that's the side wind speed. And then we move on to the effective wind speed, which is this one here. Because once you determine the effective wind speed, you'll be able to determine the dynamic pressure. So starting from bottom to the dynamic pressure. All right, we're starting with the first variable. 
Now I've got this map of the Sultanate of Oman and I want to determine the basic wind speed. Again, it depends on your uh, on your project location. Our project is in Masqat. That means for Masqat, the VP, the basic wind speed is 30 meter per second. All right, so I've got it. This is my VP for the city of Masqat. Right, now I have to determine the altitude factor, the SA. And the SA is equal to 1 plus 0 0.001 delta S. The delta S, the elevation to main sea level. Again, this was given in the example. It's 110 meters above the main sea level. And I only pay attention for this because I only can use this one here, the altitude factor. I can use this formula if the topography is not significant. What that means is if you refer to the figure seven of the code, it tells you basically if you are constructing somewhere in hill or ridge or escarpment, then your topography is, con is considered to be significant. Now, if I'm constructing here, definitely it will be different from constructing somewhere there. The wind here will be stronger than the one here. And that's a matter of fact. I'm assuming my building will not be in anywhere uh, with, with, with uh, a significant topography. And again, this figure uh, doesn't give that specific uh, information about the topography significance. Again, you have to refer to figure seven of the code. It will tell you whether your location is, has a, a significant topography or not. Anyways, if your topography is significant, then you cannot use this formula. You have to refer to the code. There is another, a separate formula for that. And in our case, it's not significant. So it is pretty easy to calculate this. It's just one plus 0 0.001 times the delta S. It turns out to be 1.11. All right, now before going through all of these factors, let's just open up very quickly the Google Maps. It is very helpful. So let's check it out. All right, here we go. This is the map of Oman. And now suppose that I'm constructing somewhere, let's see, not here, but at a distance of, as I said, 12 kilometer away from the sea. It can be some anywhere. Um, it can be located anywhere. And you should have the location of your uh, construction. Let it be somewhere, maybe here. And if I just right click, go to the measure distance, and then you can measure the distance. So my project is somewhere there, and I want to measure the closest distance to C. Right, it tells you 10 kilometer. If I'm, well, that's 12 kilometer. If I'm considering uh, this region, all right, so this is how you calculate it, and it's very easy. Also, we talked about the topography. That means if I'm constructing somewhere here, it will not be the same if I'm constructing somewhere there, okay? Now this topography is significant. That means you cannot use that formula. But if I'm constructing somewhere here, you see, it's flat, ground, and well, the topography is not significant here. All right, let's get back to our slides. All right, so we have the SA as 1.11, and these three are the easiest. All of them will be equal to one. How is that possible is, let me quote from the quote. First of all, the orientation, the direction factor. The quote says if the orientation of the building is unknown or ignored, the value of the direction factor should be taken as one. So I'm ignoring the orientation of my building and I'm taking the SD as one. And for the seasonal factor, for permanent buildings, I'm building exposed to the wind for a continuous period of more than six months. Then again, the value is one. And lastly, the probability factor is also another one. So we have all of them. Now I need to get back to this with the VS and determine the site wind speed. 
So it's just 30 times, that's the basic wind speed, times the SA factor, 1.11 times 1 times 1 and times another one. My side wind speed turns out to be 33.3 .3 meter per second. Right, now I can just get back to the VE and determine the effective wind speed. I've got here the, um, my wind speed, my side wind speed, but there's this factor here, the SB. The SB factor must be determined from table 4 of the code. And that depends on the height of the building and closest distance to C. The height we set for both the cases, for both the directions, whether you take it at 0 degree or 90 degree. The height of my building, I'm taking that height to be 12 meters. There is one thing that you have to select. Is your construction in country or in town? Now the city of Muscat is big. It has in town regions and it has in country regions. Basically, if you if you are in country regions, that means you are dealing with open flat level with less obstructions. And in town, we're talking about urban regions. Now for the city of Muscat again, you find this type and you find this type as well. But remember, I'm talking about an industrial warehouse. Usually you don't construct it uh, not even near to, to the town, it's somewhere far from the town. So I'm considering in country. And why should I determine whether it's in country or in town? Because the code, the table four here, gives you two columns. This column deals with the site in country. And this column here deals with the site um, in town. For our example, it's here. All right, I've got the effective height, 12 meters. It lies somewhere between 10 and 15. Okay. Now the closest distance to see, I'm taking whether I'm taking I'm taking this as 10 kilometer rather than 12 kilometers, because if you check the table, if you check this column here, uh, the closest distance to see upwind, I have this 10 here, and I have something more than or equal to 100. So instead of going like for 12, which means somewhere here, I can reduce it to 10 kilometer and make life easy for me. So my calculation is here within the in-country and the closest distance I'm taking this as 10. I'm being even more conservative on this. Right, now the code allows you to use linear interpolation because I've got the height as 12 meters, so it's somewhere between 10 and 15. So my value lies somewhere between 1.73 and 1.82. Using the linear interpolation, now the y1 and the y2 correspond to the sb value and the x1 and x2 correspond to the effective height. So my height is 12 meters, the actual height, and I want to determine the y, the value in between. All right, just plug and check for the y. What I get is 1.766. Uh, again, the value of y is just the value of the SB and just get back very quickly and check it. It must be somewhere between this value and this value. 1.76 lies between this value and this value. This is just to double check that you are not going somewhere else. All right, I've got all what I need. My VE is then equal to 33.3. .3. That's the side wind speed times the SB factor, okay? So the effective wind speed is 58.8 meter per second. Now, I can easily determine the dynamic pressure, the QS. And don't worry about the unit. Here it's in meter per second. Uh, once you put it in meter per second, it's going to give you a value of Newton per meter square. That's the dynamic pressure. And for the dynamic pressure, we don't really deal with a, a Newton per meter square. We deal with a kilo Newton per meter square. So what you need to do here is just Put the 0 0.613 times the effective wind speed divided by 1000 and you get the dynamic wind pressure. All right, so we have it. We have the dynamic wind pressure. Now, again, the dynamic wind pressure has to be divided for the two cases of pressure. Now, we've got the external pressure and we've got the internal pressure. 
Now we have to combine all of them, the action of both the pressures, to get the net surface pressure. That's the resultant pressure. And basically, well, I've got this external pressure on my building, and I've got the internal pressure as well. So what do you need to do here is just take the resultant, take the net surface pressure. Anyways, um, we need to stop here because the calculation for the external pressure and the internal pressure and then the net surface pressure might take time. It's not difficult, it's not complex, but it's lengthy. Uh, it's because we have this external pressure coefficient and the external pressure coefficient. They probably take the biggest chunk of this video and we should leave an entire part for them for, for their calculation. So for the next part, we will be dealing with external pressure coefficient and the internal pressure coefficient. Only just substitute them here to get the external pressure, the internal pressure, and then if I need to find the net surface pressure on our building. All right, so I'll see you in the next part and thank you very much for watching.